Um, welcome back to Metabolic Engineering. Um, and we're going to pick up where we left off on flux balance analysis today, um, making our way into 13 carbon labeled um, or just generally isotope labeled um, flux analysis. Um, so, so far we've been uh, working towards this progression where you add up reactions manually after we've acquainted ourselves pretty deeply with different biochemical pathways and methods for calculating yields. And today we're going to dive in a little bit more um, into some of the computational tools available for flux balance analysis, different kinds of flux balance analysis techniques. There are subtle differences. I'll try to make them not as subtle. Um, and then we will, um, I'll show you an example of some publicly available flux balance analysis tools and what those files look like. Um, and then we'll talk about, uh, in the spirit of discussing their limitations, that's the same way actually that um, Professor Antoniewicz had framed um, the transition into the next topic, which is why you'd want to use tracers uh, or isotope labeled compounds. So this is a slide I think that we ended on last time. Um, this was just providing a history, kind of an old history, since this is from a, a review published in 2002, of, of where this, these ideas came from and, and who you know, first pioneered them. And Professor Papatsakis in our department, um, who teaches the other elective that several of you are in or have taken, um, was really a pioneer in this space, um, which is probably why you see some of this information um, in both courses. Um, but so you could use linear programming and you can make these ca calculations initially. Um, and you could do so with a, a smaller set of, of, uh, of pathways and knowledge about those pathways. And you can do that in one organism. And we'll go over an example of that. Um, really what you've seen in, in the field, uh, even since 2002, is this idea of trying to um, expand sort of the number of reactions that are accounted for. Um, you know, can we really in order to predict more accurately um, how a, a microbe's physiology might be under different conditions. You'd want to account for that. You'd also want to think about compartments. So even a simple microbe, um, prokaryotes that don't have what we traditionally think of as compartments in terms of organelles, still have you know, maybe their periplasm and um, their cytoplasm. And certain molecules don't go in and out, others do. Um, sometimes they only go one way. And so if you have some species in metabolism, even if they're not predominant, and they're, they, they have some kind of pathway that, that just sends them out of the cell, you would want to have a reaction in your model that accounts for that as a sink. Because effectively, you know, you'd have a pathway to some compound, and then even if there's another reaction downstream, you have this competing um, consumption reaction. It's not really consumption, but it's sending the metabolite out of the cell so that it can't be used. So, so compartmentalization and, um, and accounting for all the reactions are important. Here at the bottom, uh, thinking about regulatory constraints. I think I mentioned at the very tail end of last time's lecture. Um, if you have a pathway that's, that is subject to feedback inhibition, you really want your your model to account for that. But these general stoichiometric models are based on flux measurements and lumped parameters and a number of assumptions. Uh, so they don't really tell you, they, they um, are a reflection of what the regulation natively might be, but they don't tell you how um, the presence or absence of different transcription factors or inhib inhibitors, et cetera, um, would respond. Uh, and um, also not reflected here, and what you started to see, I think, um, around the, the early 2000s, is um, incorporation of kinetic data. So these flux uh, balance analysis approaches are largely material and energy balances that uh, reflect um, you know, more of a thermodynamic perspective um, than a kinetic perspective. And part of that is because we don't necessarily have all of the rate constants that we might need um, for each of the enzymes involved. Um, but you could imagine that that would be um, a major factor, that you might have an enzyme that is just, you know, it's saturated in terms of it's operating at its K-cat. Um, the substrate is well above its Km. So it just can't make more um, 
you know, and so that, that could be important to know. Whereas if you're on a different part of the enzyme kinetic curve and you have that increase in substrate concentration, you might get a very different um, activity profile. So we'll talk about all of these things and more um, throughout today. Um, this is uh, that first paper that sort of oops, referenced here, um, or maybe right before this, I think it, this is the 1984 paper, it was just accepted in 83, um, of uh, Terry Papatsakis while he was a professor at Rice, looking into um, butyric acid bacteria. Um, so there are classes of bacteria that um, were known to produce butyrate and related bacterial species um, and overlapping um, that have a pathway known as the acetone butanol ethanol pathway. Um, and I won't spend too much time on this because uh, again, Terry is teaching the other course on biochemical engineering and has maybe talked about some of this already. Um, but all of those compounds, uh, some of which we've discussed in earliest, earlier classes, are commodity chemicals or fuels. So eth ethanol, acetate, um, butanol, butyrate, these are all really low value compounds where it can be really important to make sure that you are, you know, calculating uh, your maximum theor theoretical yields correctly and operating at that max because you need that kind of margin. Um, and so you can see here um, a figure directly from his paper that shows different reactions um, as it relates to some of these species and then uh, tables in which um, Terry's collected some experimental data. There's also some data from the literature in one of the clostridial species, Acetobutilicum, named so for its tendency to produce acetate um, and butanol, butyrate. Um, and so you can see these species right here. Um, Clostridia is an anaerobe, an obligate anaerobe, um, and it can utilize diverse carbon sources. Um, and so it may be in this case, I haven't checked. It looks like it's fermenting glucose here um, and producing H2CO2 as well as some of these products. Um, so there are calculations, uh, including maximum theoretical yields. Um, and I don't really know if there's much more to emphasize here. And when I post these notes, you can. Can look through if you're curious for more of the details. 